Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm with Wikibon.org. I'm here with John MacArthur. And this is theCUBE, SiliconAngle.tv's continuous coverage. We're here live in Orlando. This is IBM Edge. This is really the first breakout conference uh, for the IBM Storage Group. Uh, we've been talking today about, you know, can IBM get its storage mojo back? Very successful uh, first attempt to really reach out to that community in a, in a branded event uh, called Edge. Now here, we're here with Jeff Jonas. Jeff is a chief scientist at IBM Entity Analytics um, and uh, a big data expert. Jeff, welcome to theCUBE. Hey man, thanks for having me. Yeah, our pleasure. So uh, we're talking off camera a little bit about how you came to IBM. Why don't you tell us that story? Well, one day I hired a CEO to run my company. I, I guess going back a little further, I started a company back, well going, going back further, I bankrupted a company when I was 20, then go. I moved into my car. Fail fast. That's yeah, uh, fail fast. Yeah, and okay. then um, after I finished crying, I started my next company from my car, and then I ended up um, hiring a CEO. That company grew up okay, and then I hired a CEO to run it, and then he said I wasn't a very good chairman. Yep. And then, uh, so we brought in a real chairman of the board, and then the two of them, um, you know, strong, gave me a stronghold, you know, a, w w uh, a, a UFC move, and yeah, yeah. sold my company to IBM, which <laughs> turns out is okay. <laughs> okay, so you sort of were fighting it to begin with. Nah, but, uh, I didn't fight but, it that much. It was much. a while ago. Right? It was, it was seven yeah. years ago. Yeah, no, one, so. no one thought I would stay. And you did stay. I did, and so. I love my job. I like, I, I, I'm working with amazing people on amazing stuff and have global access to really interesting problems, and it's, Fun. IBM is an interesting culture because it, uh, there's 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 a lot of things that sort of drive behavior at IBM because they are such a large company that's been around so, sort of humorless in some areas because it's this is these are important <laughs> issues. They're, 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 right? Not a lot of swashbucklers, I guess I would say, right? So uh, I, and you seem like having lived out of a car, um, you know, but more of a swashbuckler's style. So how does uh, your personality integrate with uh, IBM's? And well, I'll, how be, do you I'll be candid. I I, uh, I was pretty sure the antibodies were going to attack. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I've sp I spent the f every month basically for the first couple of years thinking they're just right around the next corner. Yeah. And the but they reality, didn't. they just did. I they mean, there would maybe there were, you could count maybe two moments where I felt like there was a little bit of uh, infringement, but it would, it's negligible. And IBM has become just a great place for me. It's like my hobby. It's you know I don't think I've had one order from my boss. And when I so let's talk about some of the really interesting things that you're doing. It's like the hit the undo bit button on, on, on the data mining, right, is kind of what, some of what you do. The undo like, button? <laughs> right? Well, a lot of times. This is the answer. Oh, no, I got new information. A lot of data, most, all the data mining stuff going on is batch, and I'm somewhat obsessed with real time. Like, yeah. raised, I, I spent a decade in the casinos, you can lose a quarter of a million in 15 minutes. Yeah. A batch job at the end of the hour? <laughs> what, what, like, why? <laughs> so I'm somewhat obsessed with the real time. And right. that is, how can you make sense of transactions as they're happening, fast enough to do something about it, while it's happening? Right. So what does that mean? In t uh, I, does, does, does that drive decisions around processing, or does it drive decisions around storage? Because you need a lot of data to analyze. Here's the interesting piece. I want you to think about it like uh, when you put a puzzle together at home. You yeah. grab a piece out of the box. It's very hard to tell what it is. It's just, it just has flames on it. Yeah. You don't know if it's good news or bad news. It might be a fire in the kitchen or a fire in the fireplace. Right. Until you take it to the puzzle and figure out where it goes, you really don't know whether it's good news or bad news. But that's about how does one piece of data find and figure out how it relates to every other piece of data ever seen. So I've got one of these, I've got a couple systems out there now with 100 terabytes of solid state, just for metadata. 100 terabytes of solid, solid state, state for state metadata. For metadata. Okay. And one of these had 20 terabytes of solid state and we maxed out the I.O. on direct attach, <laughs> so we went to 100 terabytes of solid state. <laughs> it's kind of exciting, That's, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so you get to put those together in the labs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, put those together in, in the mission. In the, like, in the mission. Yeah. Like real, real, real customers, real, real projects. Can you, are there any things that you can no. talk about? I didn't think no, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you talk about, everybody talks about connecting the dots, talk about yeah. big data. The Osama hit, right? <laughs> yeah. were, you, were you involved in that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Most people I ask at Big Data go, I can't say. No, uh, I, don't, I don't think I had anything. So the first honest that. answer you got. Right. Are you sure? <laughs> you know, you got to be careful not to overclaim. Are you, are I'm you sure? 100 yeah. percent sure. It's like the number of people that take take credit. But no one would tell me anyway. Yeah. I don't have any clearance, government clearances. Yeah. So like you know, but I'm like 100 percent sure I wasn't. Yeah. 
Yeah. Do you think big data was involved in that? Is that real time enough? Well, it depends what the definition of big data is. Some people just call everything big data. Well, then sure. What's your definition? <laughs> My definition of big data is something magical happens when you put enough data together in the right way. Something changes. It's, it starts to behave differently. And I, I've done a few speeches about this called Big Data New Physics. And, and yeah. what this is, is it turns out the more data you get, puzzle pieces to puzzles, not pile of puzzle pieces, puzzle pieces to puzzles, you get lower false positives and lower false negatives. That means the predictions are bad. The bad data in your enterprise, you're going to be glad you didn't clean it. It turns out the bad data helps you. And get this, the more data you get, not only does it get more accurate, it gets faster to process. You need less CPU. You need less CPU. I saw this in 2006, a system with three billion rows of data. When it got to eight billion, it was more accurate, and the cost to ingest the next piece was going down. I'll, t I'll explain how this works in 15 seconds. Okay, go. Why is it when you put a puzzle together at home, the last few pieces are as easy as the first few? You have more data in front of you than ever before. Why is that? That. What happens is the puzzle puffs out, and then it begins to collapse. And while it's collapsing, it's getting more accurate, and your decision about where to place the piece starts to increase. I saw that for the first time in 2006. I'm engineering systems today that are designed to take advantage of exactly that. And I think it significantly is going to change what's possible in big data. So, so um, I remember a puzzle that my kids and I had when uh, they were little, uh, we put together, and some of the pieces were exactly the same size, and they all fit in the right, it, right? So you could, you could absolutely put the wrong piece in a place where it fit, right? Yeah, so that's called a false positive. Right. And what generally happens in a puzzle is you'll, and it doesn't happen that often, but it can happen. If the puzzle has a lot of the same shapes and a lot of the same colors, more ambiguity. But how do, they, how do you find them? The way you find them is the arrival of new puzzle pieces. Because now you find another piece, you go, it goes right here. Wait a minute, the piece next door is fighting me. You actually discover false positives while you continue the puzzle assembly process. So the big mistakes that people are making in big data are what? Not paying enough uh, well, attention I'll, I'll, to I, that. I think one of the big mistakes is if you try to do everything batch, you're going to find out that you're producing answers. As soon as you start giving the business users really great answers every Monday morning, it's not going to take long, assuming they're great answers, for them to say, why did I have to wait till Monday morning? They left the website, we already gave them the loan. Yeah. So All there's right. a class of things that I think are going to be well suited for big data batch, but I think there's a whole slew of things that can be done in real time while the data is streaming. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So is the growth in real time, or is the in, in real time decision making? Is that where the big investment is for IBM, or is it both? I. Uh, it's really both. They they play off each other real nicely. You you need to be able to. Let me differentiate these for a second. There's a moment in when you're trying to make sense of stuff while the transaction's happening. You're trying to do something about it while right. it's happening. Right. Call like, a credit, like a credit card validation, <laughs> right. for example. You got a half a millisecond to respond. Otherwise, it goes to the other service provider. Right. Something like yep. that. And that, you can think of that as sense and respond. Right. But there's another aspect where you want to be able to deeply reflect over what you know. And this is no different than when you're sitting on the couch at the home at the end of the day, and you're just thinking about what you know, you're data mining on yourself, yeah. you're not reading emails or watching TV, and you go, oh, that's interesting, and you, you re something is revealed. Those are two very dis distinct processes, and they're both two different legs on the stool. And the tighter you can feedback loop them between each other, I think it, that's what's going to make organizations more competitive. And you would argue that you can take the second, which is the reflection on the couch, and instantiate that in code? I think we, yeah, I think, yeah. I think people do that right now with predictive analytics. You do deep reflection, you go analyze the 70,000 fraud cases and you realize that there's three factors that are almost always true. Mm -hmm. That discovery is something you'd want to then instantiate on the stream. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Jeff, you, you gave us your definition of big data. What's your definition of real time? Fast. <laughs> I, right now, my my goals are like sub 200 milliseconds sense and response. So it's fast enough to blink. Sub 200 milliseconds. Okay, so it's not. For some of the, so the it's things not, I'm trying so to work really on. It's not really fast. For the, well, I, you know, if you're a jet fighter pilot and it's a heads up system, I don't know. I, I, but I'm my work right now. I'm trying to do sub 200 milliseconds. Let me tell you what. I'll tell you what's hard about this. I'm going to just tell you the hardest piece. You've seen a billion puzzle pieces, you made a billion bets. Where the puzzle piece goes? You get piece billion and one. At the moment you get that, you have to say, now that I know this, had I known that in the beginning, over the billion decisions I've made, should I have made any of them differently? And if you can't let new observations reverse earlier assertions, your whole model drifts from the truth. Doing that at thousands per second, over billions of rows of data, with hundreds of millions of entities, is non-true. We've been working on that for eight years right now, 
on 100 terabytes of solid state, I can do that at about 2,000 decisions a second. And what I'm working on now, my new next generation stuff, codename G2, two and a half years secretly. Yeah. Which you just started about writing that. about. I just started writing about. It's yeah. just, and it's coming of age. And the world will see more of this. It's, 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 uh, I've done something radical in the schemas designed for grid compute to collapse this window of time about how, what's the latency to change your mind about the past over a trillion rows of data. That's what I'm working on now. So, are you clamoring for an entire new I.O. architecture to support this vision? I need access. The funny thing is, it's kind of like extreme OLTP. Any piece of data that arrives is just as likely to need any piece you've ever seen. Right. So that means you can't optimize in the way where like, oh, let's just take the most recent stuff and flush it to the top. All of it. Right. The, and that's why you end up with these 100 terabyte solid state kinds of instances. Now the question is, how do you even further collapse that latency? What if I took 100 terabyte instance of solid state and then I said, now I want 100 of those. So I've been designing something that can talk across a grid like that mm -hmm. and it always knows where every piece of data is. It never has to broadcast. So what do you make of um, you know, all this the Hadoop talk, Hadoop is batch, MapReduce 1, MapReduce 2, Son of MapReduce, whatever. Um, can that world play in, in real time? Well, I don't think it can play in real time, but I think it can play in, in, um, in deep reflection. And deep reflection is, is hugely important to making organizations smarter. So here's, here's, my, here's how I see it. Puzzle pieces are arriving, every time a piece of data arrives in the enterprise, it just learns something. At that second, what most organizations do today is they let the data land and they wait for users to ask it questions. There are not enough humans to ask every question every day. What needs to happen is every piece of data is the question because you just learned something. So that means when a piece of data arrives, it's like a puzzle piece, it lands in a puzzle, and you're figuring out where it belongs. Then you're taking information in context, where you know things that are the same, you know the things that are related, and you're publishing in context data to these big batch processes so, so for deep reflection. These are the questions that you should be asking, and sort of. What you can notice when it's landing is, it's like the little kid, the baby that never doesn't know a bee stings. You watch the bee hovering on them and the baby thinks it's cute. Hmm. They don't have a feedback loop. Right? right? So sometimes it's a secondary process. Sometimes you got stung. Right. But whatever that is, gets inserted back up into, and then in real time, you know when to duck, you can go, hey, something's not right about this. And again, it's these dual processes. And the question is, I've been doing these puzzle projects with kids and adults to, to because it's inspiring them on, on my algorithms. I mean, literally, I'm watching people put puzzles together and finding really subtle things about the cognitive process about bringing, making sense out of diverse data, where I hide the puzzle pieces, right? I have puzzles from many puzzles in one pile. And it's really, it's really interesting. But one of the things I've learned is the cycle time between real-time sense-making versus a chance to deeply reflect. And the tighter you couple that, the more intelligent things seem to become. Jeff, what, um, as an IBMer working in your organization, what advantages do you have relative to when you were a startup and what disadvantages are there? I think the, the advantage is when, when you have a, right after acquisition, I got to go see the labs. Yeah. I can tour it around the labs. Well, I'm like built a company out of my car kind of guy. So when you go see what it means when, when an organization's spending $6 billion a year in R&D. So I would go to each lab and I would talk for an hour about what I do. And then they would hand pick five or six things to show me at each lab. Unbelievable. Like it's just jaw dropping. Yeah, so that's, what's exciting to me is the access to that kind of investment, which is really unique. There's very few companies on earth that are that committed to the R&D process. Um, and then the hard part is, you know, it's any, all these big organizations are matrixed. If you cannot establish a coalition of the willing, right. it's hard to get from point A to point B. So part of the way that, and it's so turning you, out okay for me, but yeah. it's, it's about coalition of the willing. And it's also, if you want to get something big done, I call it a tightly held conspiracy to do good. <laughs> huh? You get a few people go, let's tell no one. Because okay. if everyone knows how important this is going to be, if everybody knew how important the internet was going to be, we'd still be discussing the standards. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. You know, you want to get something that's going to grow up and be big, keep yeah. it small, yeah. try to make it so it can go viral later. But So how's it work? It's, so it's not like a grab bag of technology that you can just reap, an invention that you can just reach into and grab and apply, or is it? Somewhat. You mean across IBM's yeah. research? I'll, I'll tell you what, for me, like, there's a very narrow band in which I think I'm smart, and then there's a other, most all other bands, I'm an actual idiot. 
So it's a narrow place where I'm useful to IBM. And in that, when I look out across IBM, like I'm talking to the blue jean people, yeah. and these blue jean folks, they explained to me how to make my kinds of thing run on blue jean, and they taught me something. And when they taught me that, it fundamentally rewired the way I think about the way data should talk to schema. Can you explain that? Okay, here's how that goes. So I'm, out, I'm, I'm talking to a couple of blue jean guys and I go, wow, the way my Nora class technology for the casinos would run on blue jean would be this. And they looked at me and goes, are you kidding? That would never scale. And it took the wind out of me. I'm like, why? And they go, and at the time I forget it was tens of thousands of nodes or something. And they go, they taught me two main things is one, you want the data evenly distributed across all the nodes. And you want every piece of data to know where it lives so you never have to ask every node. Those were the two main takeaways. How does that translate? Well, what it translated to me was I need schemas where I'm going to index everything on a hash so it's evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to only have one index per schema so that you never have to be optimal on one schema and suboptimal on the others. Okay. Good. And I some other little trickery around that, but it's damn exciting for me, <laughs> I got to tell you. So my colleague, John Furrier, who uh, I, this is actually the first time I've ever seen him give up the mic. I know. Uh, I was, where is he, by the way? Right you, I always heard he was going to be John's here. John's right here. He's right there. Yeah, I so. know, I'm horsing around. And, uh, <laughs> and so he actually has a few questions. He's, he's actually right? really so angry just, now about, he's about just, giving he up the mic. He just fired off like seven or eight to me, but some, some of the ones that he's really interested in, so I'll give you credit, John. What are the top trends in big data that aren't yet on people's radar? <clears throat> I'll tell you what's coming fast is geospatial data about where you and I are and how we move. It is going to blow your socks off. In the, in the US today, 600 billion records are being created every single day about where you and I are when and how we move. 600 billion a day. And this data is being anonymized and shared with secondary companies. And the kinds of predictions you can make are stunning. And this is going to lead to a whole bunch of privacy challenges. Right. So I find myself working with things called space-time boxes about about defining where things are when, and then how to anonymize space time. Yeah, boxes. you've done a lot of work around privacy. Yeah, I've, I've my, in fact, my new G2 project, I've got more privacy yeah. features baked into it than anything I've ever created. Yeah, yeah. I thought absolutely. there was no privacy in the internet. We're supposed to get over it. Isn't that a Scott McNeely quote on the cube? Yeah, get over it. Yeah. <laughs> so the other question John had is, what fundamental you know changes are you seeing in trends in computer science that are changing the status quo? Touched on some of them. I think this notion of what I would call incremental context accumulation. So here, okay, let me step back and say this. <clears throat> what has been happening is if you have structured data, you use structured data analytics. It's like, oh, those are the red puzzle pieces? Well, process them with the red puzzle piece processor. Ah, you have unstructured data. Well, those are blue puzzle pieces. Ah, that's good, because we have blue puzzle piece processors. And then Twitter, Magenta, oh, we got Magenta. And the problem is if you process each puzzle piece in isolation, you can get some gains, but those gains start to flatten out. Yeah. General purpose context accumulation says you can take a very wide feature space a cross structured, unstructured, social, geospatial, biographic, biometric pick, and how do you weave all those puzzle pieces together? The, the quality of predictions that you can get out of that, I kid you not, what I believe is imminent is com we're going to see computers more frequently arguing about something with a human and the computer being bright more often. And I have one example of that. You want to hear one example? Yeah, please. So one day in my little email inbox, I get this uh, press release about something where one, one of my technologies is running. It's yeah. for MoneyGram. I didn't have anything to do with it, really. So a lot of them I do, but this one's new to me. So I'm looking at it, right? The day they turn on context accumulation where data's coming together, yeah. fraud drops, I think, 70-something percent. Fraud complaints. Fraud complaints drop over 70 percent. That's nothing. Get this. <laughs> I'm reading this, and it actually choked me up. 100-year-old grandmother um, goes to MoneyGram, says, transfer 2,500 to grandson. And MoneyGram says, no, we think it's fraud. She goes, it's not fraud. Let's talk on the phone. MoneyGram says, no. She goes, I've been giving you my business for years. Uh. <laughs> this is my time of need. You will transfer it. MoneyGram loses nothing if they transfer it. But they were so confident in their prediction, they still told her no. She calls back three days later in tears thanking them. That's cool. That's cool. That's a prediction where you're wow. so confident you can dispute a human who's the closest contextually. That's interesting. Yeah. And I think context accumulation, diverse things coming together are gonna, are gonna do all kinds of interesting things. So we've been, uh, my last question, we've been batting around this premise that was put forth by Peter Goldmacher of Cowan on theCUBE. And basically he said, look, 
you know, we're talking about who's going to make the money, who's the big winners. He said the guys who are going to win in big data are the big data practitioners, the guys that are you know, using big data and creating value for, <coughs> for their customers, um, you know, versus you know, the suppliers, right? which I think is an interesting premise. Um, what advice would you give to those big data practitioners in terms of um, what they should be doing, where they should be focused, how they can create that value? You know, about a few years ago, somebody on stage said that every time you can take a half a millisecond, a millisecond out of something, you can save 100 million a year. And now, Goldman Sachs. It was Goldman Sachs, 2008. Every, every millisecond is 100 million dollars a year. What I think comes next, you know, see, first it's Web 2.0, everything's connected. Phase two is pretty soon, it's all about the data. Now the question is, what, what can you do analytically on the data? And what's left to compete with? Here's what I think it is. It is latency. The compet if, if, you, if all of us have access to a similar observation space, then the next question is, who can make sense of it fastest? So I think the real big game next is compression of latency. And so, thus 100 terabyte, 200 terabyte solid state storage arrays, You're serving up yeah. to metadata processors or schemas that can process faster than anybody else is how can you integrate what you're observing? Yep. You're not just comparing the puzzle pieces that flies by. Imagine the puzzle piece first slams into the puzzle and finds a chunk, and what comes out of the back is richness, rich com context. And then you're going to use that for really fine grain decisioning. And it's going to be over super fast I.O. All right, Jeff Jonas, we're out of time. This was uh, fantastic. <laughs> thanks very much for hey, coming man. on theCUBE. Yeah, thanks for Great having me here. Thanks to John uh, Furrier for letting me uh, sit <laughs> in uh, We're at IBM Edge. We'll be right back after this word. Keep it right there.